some big news today out of Google and OpenAI. First and foremost, Sam Altman says he's feeling the AGI today. Here's a shot with the OpenAI core team and to everyone's great relief, Ilya Sutskever is okay. He's alive, seems happy, and everyone's looking pretty cheerful. My only question is, where do I get this shirt? Ilya, where do I get this shirt? Unfortunately, this isn't because of anything happy and pleasant happening. It looks like Ilya and OpenAI are going to part ways. Not only that, but Jan Lakey, machine learning researcher, co-leading super alignment at OpenAI. Well, he says, I resigned, which of course people are saying is not a good sign. Now, of course, we have multiple people that have been leaking information out of OpenAI, have been terminated, Ilya is leaving, John Lakey is leaving. What is happening? Well, let's start here. Sam Altman posted this, Ilya and OpenAI are going to part ways. This is very sad for me. Ilya is easily one of the greatest minds of our generation, a guiding light in our field and a dear friend. Now, I'm not going to read all of this because, you know, in times like this, you generally post the things that you're supposed to say, the things that everyone expects. You can even notice that Sam Altman drops his usual casual, uncapitalized letters, and this is more formal. I'm sure he means what he says, but this obviously is polished because it's going to be going to a lot of people. As you can see here, 4.2 million views. There are a couple of things that caught my eye. He's saying, I am forever grateful for what he did here and committed to finishing the mission we started together, which was building OpenAI, building AGI, being a counterbalance to Google. That was the initial role that him and Elon and Greg formed back in 2016, 2017, whenever that was, or potentially even started talking about in 2015, if I recall correctly. And Jacob is going to be our new chief scientist. So that's Jacob Pachoki. He's right there on the left here in this shot. And he previously served as the director of research, spearheading the development of GPT-4 and OpenAI-5. You may not remember OpenAI-5 or not be familiar with it. It was from a very, very long time ago, very ancient time, if we're talking about AI timelines from 2019, where the OpenAI 5 completely wiped the floor with the human players in Dota 2. So of course, both OpenAI 5 and DeepMind's Alpha Star were the two kind of competing AIs that both the companies, OpenAI and DeepMind, tried to make them competitive at playing these Blizzard games, or at least, you know, game ideas that at some point were part of Blizzard games, because Dota did start out as a custom map in Warcraft 3, I believe. But here's that shot. I see Greg right there in the background. He's right there. There is Jacob. And here's kind of a replay of that match, I believe. So I don't know the exact specific details, but as you can see here, the OpenAI 5 are called, uh, the names of the players are OpenAI 3, OpenAI 2, and then it says bot. In quotations, there they are. And yeah, I mean, it kind of looks like they're playing in a similar fashion that a real life human player would play, moving back and forth, retreating, etc. One interesting thing that I heard during the interview with the human players that were playing against these bots, afterwards they mentioned that the one thing that they found kind of disturbing about playing with the bots is that the OpenAI bots had a very good understanding of when to engage in a fight and when not to. Meaning that if they were retreating, it was probably because they knew that they would lose. If they attacked, there was a very high chance that they would indeed win. So as the human players picked up on that, they realized that if the bots engaged in a fight, that would probably not be good for them. And that is GG game over. OpenAI taking game two, taking the series two to zero. This was the first time an AI beaten esports pros on live stream but the other big finding was while the training process was exclusively focusing on beating other bots the OpenAI 5 discovered the rudimentary ability to be a teammate with humans so kind of cooperative play playing alongside humans to defeat the other team and so now Jacob is stepping up as the new chief scientist at OpenAI. Ilya Suskover also posted recently saying, after almost a decade, I made the decision to leave OpenAI. The company's trajectory has been nothing short of miraculous, and I'm confident that OpenAI will build AGI that is both safe and beneficial under the leadership of Sam, Greg, Mir Mirati, and now under the excellent research leadership of, I'm guessing that's Jacob, Jacob Pachoki, 
but open AI. And Jacob thanked Ilya for all of his wisdom and mentorship. And Ilya is saying, I'm excited for what comes next, a project that is very personally meaningful to me, about which I will share details in due time. Could it be that Andre and Ilya start a truly open AI company? Is it possible that a lot of these people are leaving to strike off on their own? Certainly that seems to be what happened with Anthropic. Anthropic AI, by the way, also is not sitting this one out as the co-founder and CTO, the chief technical officer of Insta has joined Anthropic AI as their chief product officer, Mike Krieger. He's going to be diving in and helping shape the future of AI-powered products at Anthropic. And on the other side of the world, there's this. A robot is able to draw Chinese characters as a man using a computer brain interface, somewhat similar to the Neuralink, is writing those characters out on a screen. The post says, robots with the help of neural implants helped a paralyzed man. A 76-year-old paralyzed man has made history by using his thoughts to write eight Chinese characters. This incredible feat marks the first successful use Xie Jiang University's brain implants to enable writing Chinese characters. The patient controls the robotic hands with his thoughts to write the Chinese characters, offering a hope for those who have lost speech and mobility to communicate again. And they're noting here that unlike alphabetic writing, implementing Chinese script through a brain-computer interface is much more complex. The volunteer imagines the writing process, which is reflected in the motor area's neuronal activity. Then the system analyzes the signals to capture the intended writing path and control the robotic arm to write. Grok is rebuilding the experiment where you had two LLM models fight each other in Street Fighter. This time, of course, using the Grok chip to make it very, very fast. As you can see here, I mean, the characters are moving very quickly. Not a lot of lag, not a lot of downtime. They're constantly at each other, blocking and countering moves, it seems like. Very impressive. So this is Gemma 7B versus ChatGPT 4 Turbo, controlling two Ken characters in a retro game. They decided to leave out the trademark name of the video game. You can see how many more moves Gemma produces in the text screen and the red text. So yes, yeah, certainly there's a lot more red text uh, than there are green text. I just think it's very interesting when they use video games to show various abilities of AI. I think it's a very good combination and, and where possible, we should use video games to demonstrate AI. I think it should be one of the rules, like we have the three laws of robotics. If we ever have some laws for AI, one of them should be Thou shall use video games to demonstrate the abilities of AI where possible. Who's with me? Call centers might be on their way out. I want to focus in on the generative AI side because you caught a lot of headlines by the fact that you said, look, now generative AI within our customer services is doing the job of 700 people. Is it still 700? Is it more than that? It's probably slightly more by now. I think the reason we shared, we knew that number would kind of catch the attention. But it's partially because I feel there's a lot of buzz around AI and there is a, a, you know, a lot of things, demos being announced and you were talking about you know, Google today announcing something. But there are a few things that are practically there and a lot of business leaders are asking themselves like, where is the actual implications on my business? Mm. And this was the first time we at least felt like, look, here's a practical application that isn't like just a small, it's real life. Consumers prefer it because it's actually higher customer satisfaction than the human agent. It's faster to use, it's higher quality, and it's having profound impact. Why pay a human when AI can do it cheaper and better and faster, more scalable? And now it seems like consumers prefer interacting with AI over humans. And Google is hitting back strong with their own suite of products, their own AI agents. And you might have noticed in one of the demos, they use some sort of AI glasses. And if you're wondering what those glasses were, this offers a hint. Google executives hint that AR glasses are poised for a comeback. If you recall the Google Glass, that was 10 years ago, back in 2014. The product didn't really work. A lot of people were not too happy about it. Stories of people getting attacked for wearing them in public, you know, specifically in, in San Francisco. The point is it didn't land well. It, it didn't work at that time. But now executives are signaling that new AI features could set the stage for AI glasses to return. So AR is augmented reality, so you're able to see certain projections through the glasses that appear in the real world, some sort of an overlay, combined with something like an AI assistant. 
and this whole thing kind of falls under the project Astra. So that's kind of the demo that we saw where the lady's walking around the office asking various questions while pointing a camera at various objects and the assistant responds seemingly very quickly, very intelligently. And as you may have noticed, I mean, some people are a little bit cautious about trusting Google with their new demos because there's some shenanigans a while back where seemingly one of the demos didn't work as advertised. It was stitched together to make it seem like something else. It was, of course, the vision demo. It seemed like as you were drawing something on a page, the assistant immediately recognized it and was able to rapidly make suggestions. Later, we found out that it was edited and that's not quite how it worked. But based on the feedback of people that actually went to the developer conference, it seems like the latency, how quickly those answers are produced, that is real. So first of all, take a look at this quick demo that Demi Sasabi posted about Project Astra. What famous piece of literature does this remind you of? That image of a skull reminds me of Hamlet. Do you enjoy Shakespeare's work? Yes, I do. Um, can you tell me what this famous thought experiment might be and explain it to me in one sentence? That looks like the ship of Theseus thought experiment. It questions whether an object that has had all of its components replaced remains fundamentally the same object. Can you give me a creative poem about these objects? A vibrant orb, a mind laid bare, time's silent passage fills the air. The fruit of thought, the sands that fall, what memories will it recall? Cool. Can you explain this diagram to me in a couple sentences? This appears to be a diagram depicting spectral lines from different elements. It is likely illustrating the characteristic frequencies of light emitted by those elements in a spectroscopic analysis. Cool. Thanks, Gemini. But the results were mixed. Here, Santiago saying that there were some issues with the Google demo. Take a look. Okay, so I was able to test Project Astra, which is uh, Google's answer to OpenAI's assistant. Now, it was a little bit weird, and I only had about two minutes to test. Uh, we went in this booth, four different people, and again, they gave us only two minutes, and they had a bunch of objects there, and a looking down camera, big screen. Uh, somebody had to wear headphones and a microphone to talk to the assistant and we could use the objects uh, just to put them in front of Astra and ask questions and tell it to do stories and whatnot. Now, I, I want to be fair because it was a loud, uh, there was a lot of noise and whatnot, but the demo did not go great. Uh, the assistant had trouble following instructions. Uh, we had to constantly say, uh, please go on, please complete the request sometimes uh, the guy in front of me asked the assistant to write a story about the objects that, that the assistant was looking at. And the assistant said, uh, yeah, sure, I can do that. And then it just stopped. And we had to say, okay, go on. And we constantly had to sort of like guide the assistant to tell the story. Uh, I went up to the screen and I drew something. And on the screen, like it was a toy screen, I drew like a little sailboat and a smiley face and it worked okay the assistant was able to recognize the sailboat and it was able to recognize the smiling face but it, it felt choppy it felt like it's not ready yet well and it isn't this is just a demo is nobody else can use it uh, so we'll have to see when it comes out how this is but my impression, my first impression, again, only two minutes using this, uh, it was not great. Now, obviously I have in mind the OpenAI presentation, the presentation they gave yesterday, that it went super smooth and it was, it was amazing to see that demo, but it was a demo as well. So I don't want to make, to compare them because I didn't get to use the OpenAI demo before using Astra. Uh, so that's that's how I felt uh, 
we'll have to see what happens in the next few weeks. All right, bye. Here's an image of somebody who got early access to check out Project Astra. Here's kind of what that looked like. No, there is something to the apple. What do you think it is? A worm. Yes. Is that all you're adding? Yes, that was it. Okay. We're going to delete this now. That looks like it work. And, uh, yeah. You guys want to turn on the model? You guys want to have it? Okay. Yeah, that was amazing. So it definitely looks like there's people that have really good results with it. Some people didn't necessarily like everything. So I think we'll have to make our decisions when we get our hands on it. But certainly it looks like the latency is good. There's not too much delay. And uh, we'll see when this comes out. They also announced having an email agent to continuously organize all the receipts in your inbox into a spreadsheet. This is the thing that I was kind of excited about because it looks like you can organize all your receipts and have the AI constantly update your financials, right? By having the intake of your email or whatever else, pulling that into Google Sheets, updating those. So basically, instead of you going line by line, cell by cell and inputting those, this will automatically take care of that for you, which I gotta say seems very cool if it can do that accurately, effectively, etc. Another one was returning an order. Say you have some shoes that you didn't like or whatever. What if you wanted to return something and you didn't have time to take care of yourself? It looks like they took a picture of that shoe and said, return this shoe and Gemini took care of everything for you. Did the email process that whole thing and it just told you what to expect without your input without you babysitting it. A search agent with multi-step researching and reasoning to find a Pilates class. One person pointed this out and I can't get this out of my head anymore because on one hand we're approaching AGI, this technology that will fundamentally shift the world. But when we're demonstrating how we're moving towards it, what are the use cases? We're demonstrating by talking about things like, here's how to find a yoga class. Here's how to plan a trip to Miami. You didn't like your pair of shoes, you poor baby. You're too lazy to return them. Well, AGI can help. And one other very interesting thing is that they've introduced a VO. So VO is their answer to OpenAI's Sora, the ability to create various text to video animations. And I mean, it looks pretty good. Certainly I wouldn't say it's as good as what Sora seems to be, but it's certainly better than or maybe on the level with Runway ML, Pika Labs, etc. We'll find out for sure again when we get our hands on it and we actually get to play around with it ourselves. But once again, we're seeing that no one really truly has a moat. No matter what you release, your competitors will not be that far behind. And a few other really big and interesting developments around the various LLM models that they're developing. We have Gemini 1.5 Flash, this is the fast multimodal model with exceptional speed and efficiency for quick high frequency tasks. Very inexpensive, 35 cents per input. So it looks like 1 million tokens are priced extremely well. 35 cents for input, 53 cents per output. So that's for 1 million tokens. They've also announced the 2 million context window and have said that their goal really is to have an infinite context window. They're saying that this is yet another step towards that infinite context window. Right now, however, we do have the 2 million token context window in private preview. By the way, a lot of this, there's a wait list for, so definitely join if you wanted to test some of this stuff out. I'm on the wait list for that new Sora competitor, VO. I'm gonna sign up for this Gemini 1.5 Pro 2 million context window right now. And then there's this, additions to the Gemma family. We have Pali Gemma, our first vision language open model that's optimized for image captioning, visual Q&A, and other image labeling tasks. Now, of course, the idea of image labeling, it's a big deal if you think about where that technology is going. Think about, for example, security cameras that are, you know, placed all over the world, recording 24 hour footage, a lot of that is useless since it's not easy to kind of parse that information, right? You have to have somebody sitting there looking at it or going over it, but it's expensive to extract insights from that footage. If you're able to have a vision language model that is able to caption those images accurately, the use cases are massive. For example, you can have one over every patient in every patient's room at the hospital. 
captioning maybe not every frame, but every few seconds, right? It goes in and says the nurse came in at 10.15 and administered this medicine. It can be used as alarms for if people are, you know, going to cardiac arrest or something like that. I mean, there's obviously other sensors for that, but it could be an extra layer of security if someone tries to escape or anything that other sensors wouldn't catch. This would be able to, in near instant real time, caption what's happening and then another language model for example kind of parse that data and if something's happening that's not supposed to happen it can alert the staff or it can log when the patient last received the medicine all automated all in real time as we've seen with open ai technology it's pretty good at detecting people's emotional state based on their faces a lot of businesses would certainly enjoy being able to kind of get a feel for what their customers alike and don't like right just automatically keep track of it obviously could be a little bit dystopian right but you know people are going to want to use this again that's where this is going that's not necessarily what polygemma is capable of right now but we know that's where it's progressing we've already seen these companies publishing details specifically focusing on on medicine on the kind of the medical establishments having something like this be able to provide insight into what's happening at hospitals for example would be a big big deal also, for example, for announcements for streaming games, sports, esports, etc. And then Gemma 2, which is going to be looks like launches in June and is built for industry leading performance at the most useful developer sizes. It outperforms some models that are more than twice the size and will run efficiently on GPUs or a single TPU. So that's the tensor processing unit, the Google's own sort of chip infrastructure in Vertex AI. Again, Google's sort of AI hub where a lot of this stuff is, right? So Polygemma can be opened in Vertex AI if you have that account, but you have to have access first. Also, the briefly mentioned Google Gems, which to me kind of sounds like the custom GPTs as in the GPT store by OpenAI, this ability to create these little functional pieces that do one specific task, some custom thing that you want them to do. And more and more agents that are coming soon, that will be dropping soon and getting integrated with various Google products. Now, keep in mind, notice that Google and pretty much everybody else are talking about AI agents. For example, here, Gemini can natively browse and use Chrome as a tool. Looks like OpenAI is partnering with Apple. They'll be on Apple phones and the Mac OS. Google, of course, has their massive, massive Android fan base. A lot of things run on the Android sort of ecosystem. People probably slightly underestimate how much stuff Google and the Android ecosystem has. Here's the global smartphone sales share by operating system. Apple's presence, of course, is very strong, very loyal, but globally, and especially at kind of like the, the cheaper prices, the cheaper range, Android is massive. Here's another way to display that. So this is the mobile operating system market share worldwide. As of 2022, Android is at around 71%, iOS is 27, and really not much else exists. Also, getting back to what I was saying earlier about everyone moving into the AI agent space, it's important to understand that these companies, yeah, they'll produce very useful agents for the everyday people. They'll help them with emails and this and that, and that's going to be excellent. But the real big power of AI agents will be the skill set you need, the ability to build them for yourself, your own custom ones, maybe ones that run locally on your machine, ones that power your business. In fact, if you've ever played Factorio, where you build this little factory and optimize it to produce various things, meticulously track its efficiency and outputs. I wish I remembered who said this first. It wasn't my idea, but I really like it. They said that in the future business, will be like managing Factorio. Only the various little pieces of it will be your very own AI autonomous agents. Earlier today, I believe, this gentleman on the right is Andrew Eng. He's one of the top tier machine learning researchers, ex-Google. He's up there amongst people like Jeffrey Hinton, Jan LeCun, etc. He's amongst the greats, if you will. And he did a very noble thing I think by actually starting deeplearning.ai, and I think he also partners with Coursera to build out free training for various AI applications. Now, a lot of this is focused on developer side, but there's a lot that he does for free. And one of the recent things that he introduced is this course. Again, it's free. It's pretty short, maybe 15 modules. 
And this gentleman, this excited gentleman on the left, he is the person that built Crew AI. And so they've partnered to produce this multi AI agent systems with Crew AI. Again, I'm not affiliated with them. This is not me pitching you anything. I'm going through it right now. I think it just came out today, if I understand correctly. And I'll kind of update everyone on how good I thought it was. I've tried Crew AI, I've messed around with it. It's good. I thought Autogen was better for some things, but I will take another look at it after going through this course. By the way, for people that are building stuff like this, what this guy is doing, partnering with Andrew Ng and doing stuff like this, that's smart. Whatever you're building, if you're teaching people how to use it on a platform where it will be seen, that's definitely a smart idea. It's a good idea. And if this is right up your alley, if this is something that you're interested in, I do want to encourage you to check out my Natural 20 private group where we all learn to use AI, learn to build these AI, autonomous AI agents. We're a thousand strong and growing rapidly. And my goal is to build this into the best online community, the most valuable and informative community that's built around how to wield AI for whatever purposes you want. So if that's something that appeals to you, join us, won't you? It would be great to have you along. But whatever you decide to do, thank you for watching this video. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time.